Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to introduce you all to the one and only, the amazing Asha Alexander. Now, Asha Alexander was the very first head teacher. She calls herself a principal. We know you all as head teachers here in the United Kingdom. Asha was the very first head teacher that got in touch with me as part of our Educate Global program and said, I want every teacher in my school to be an Educate Global climate change teacher. And that was, you know, back then we just had the climate change teacher course and it was very simplistic. And I thought, yeah, she's just going to come in and she's going to do it herself. She's going to get a certificate and I'm not going to hear from her again. But that didn't happen. So about two weeks later, we started noticing that our phones started going absolutely mental and we heard this bing, 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 bing. And then my team, support team was saying, something is going on here. We have like hundreds of teachers doing this course and they're asking for their certificates. So uh, Asha masterminded that every single teacher in her school did the Educate Global Climate Change teacher course as it was last year. 327 teachers, I think boards of governors did the course, or even the support staff, the teaching assistants, the parents. So we went over to visit Asha's school in Dubai with the Guardian. The Guardian did a visual feature and I went with um, Jan Parnell, the Director of Education for Hammersmith and Fulham, and Sally Brooks, a head teacher, um, executive head of Fulham Girls and Fulham Academy, and Tara Numbeg, the head teacher of an award-winning school in Hammersmith and Fulham Borough Council. Because we thought, we need to go and see what's going on over there. So now, Asha, we've had COVID-19, and I would like to know how you see sustainability and climate change being delivered as part of the recovery curriculum. Thank you for that introduction, Melanie. I think uh, after we had done wonderfully well in embedding climate literacy in our classrooms, it was off to a great start and suddenly the pandemic has uh, cast a pall of gloom right across. The common thread that has run through this current lived experiences of our children is loss. A loss that is emanating from three significant dynamics, anxiety, trauma, and bereavement. For them, all of a sudden, everything has been wiped out in an unplanned fashion. It has affected the children and their mental health is fragile. So even as we look to reintroducing and inventing the climate literacy program in our children, the first thing that we want to do when they come back to school is address the gaps that have happened in their learning over the last uh, six months when we have been closed. In fact, our kindergartners have never seen the physical school. We opened our school in April this year, and we were already in the remote learning mode. So there is much to do to bridge those skill gaps and to look at how we are going to introduce climate literacy. First, we have to look at the recovery of the teachers and the children who have had significant amounts of loss in terms of the um, relationship loss because they've not been able to meet with their teachers. They've not been able to associate with their friends. They've had these gaps which have to be filled and addressed first before we look at a green recovery curriculum for students as they return to school. So we had put a lot of things we had planned on the back burner because it couldn't take off in the virtual world. Now we are hoping that once children are back and they have had uh, this you know, recovery, which we hope to put in a gradual manner across the school, I think teachers and parents and uh, head teachers should be aware you can't pick up where you left off. You can't go in. It is very naive to think that you can start where you had left off in February when you closed the school. So you have to be prepared for a different kind of children. We've all been affected by the pandemic. 
in ways that we may not realize. So it's not back to business as usual when we get back to school. We have to make sure that our teachers have recovered. Our children have, are up to date on the skills where, where they have a supposedly a gap, maybe in reading, maybe in writing because they've been on the computer all of the time. And having addressed those gaps, gradually we've got to find space for emotional recovery. So this is a great thing that Jan Parnell and uh, Hammersmith and Fulham are doing in introducing the emotional recovery curriculum. So that's something which has to be adapted to each school in its own context, in according to its own communities, because children would have seen loss up uh, front in some cases, in some cases, they've heard about losses internationally and nationally. Everyone is overcome by anxiety. And teachers and adults and parents are conveying that anxiety unwittingly to the children who are absorbing it. So there's a lot that needs to be done to correct that element of our curriculum. And we have to see it as part of the curriculum. We have to make space for it. We have to make space for that recovery. We have to plan to introduce it gradually. And once we're sure that that human angle, that well-being of teacher and student are in place, then we can go ahead with transacting our uh, climate change and the rest of it. So the first thing that I would do when I get back and when I get our children back into our schools is to address uh, in a compassionate way the human element, which is addressing we are all steeped in the results culture we are running after outcomes and great results at the board levels and things like that and we actually fail to see that if a child is not well and it's the teacher is not well the outcomes will not be as good as what we expect children have would have lost self confidence self esteem especially the teenagers they cannot uh, build their sense of self against family rules and regulations because it is the peer dynamics that determine for them who they are. They're not uh, who they are because of what their parents say. They're who they are because of their peers. And they have to get back and establish those relationships. They are fundamental to learning. And if we as educators ignore this recovery, we cannot put any kind of literacy in place, let alone climate literacy. So that is what we're going to do as a first step to make sure that our teachers and children are well and safe and happy and they reestablish those connections because teaching is a profession that's all about relationships. And now we're only having relationships over the uh, screen and you can't talk to children in the corridors. You don't know what is the hiding behind their uh, screens. They mask their backgrounds. We can't even see what's going on as individuals in their homes. There is so much that's happening to children, which we must value and respect mm. if we want to make sure that actual learning, which is useful, takes place in our classrooms. Mm. So I'm very, very happy that Educate Global and uh, Hammersmith and Fulham are giving this emotional recovery curriculum free of cost to all of the schools that will enable them to get that footing in place. Because if they haven't thought about it and they're rushing back to their lessons, they're doing more harm than good. Asha, do you think that um, there is going to be a transitionary period do you need to prepare these parents and families before the children come back? Is that what you plan to be doing with your pupils? Can you give us some insight into what you want to do, how you see it working? Absolutely, Melanie. Even as of now, we're surveying parents who are still skeptical about sending youngsters wearing masks. They're asking hundreds of questions. The first thing we doing is to be open with communication, being absolutely transparent, showing them the classrooms, showing them the preparations to invite the children in. At the same time, the teachers are going to be running a week-long program with every parent in every grade 
educating them about the expectations, some of which I've shared with you, that it's not going to be the same. So do not get upset if your children are not learning at the pace that you're used to. Do not set high expectations of getting back and getting on with it and you know, getting back your grades and learning. As adults, we sort of think we can switch between what is happening and what was very easily. Even we, unknown to us, have been affected to a great extent by the pandemic. Uh, we've also been resentful of our freedom being taken away. We do not like to go out. We, we would like to go out, but we're unable to do so. There are a lot of things that are happening that we haven't really spent time reflecting on to understand what is the change that is happening within us as adults. And so parents must also be educated, made to think, and that is the plan we have in place for all of two weeks, starting Sunday. We're going to be talking to parents in small groups, feel the questions, tell them what to expect, ask them to reflect and think about what changes have occurred to them, what have we seen in students who have been at home? How has their behavior changed? Was there a routine? Because if a routine was disrupted and there was no structure, it is very difficult to get back children onto a structure and a routine in September. It just doesn't say snap, you come back, sit in your class, wear your masks and get used to the constraints being brought about by the pandemic. So it's a lot to do with educating them making them think about it and reflect on it. So we have had to have focused plans in place to deal with every year group and discuss and take parents' feedback on board mm -hmm. because I think being transparent and building that trust because they're leaving their children with us is fundamental to making sure that our learning programs uh, take place effectively. Asha, do you feel, now this might, I, I don't want to offend at all, do you feel that this may be an opportunity for you to now start changing parts of the curriculum that no longer serve us? Because what would have served us post, pre-COVID-19, pre now post-COVID-19 is no longer required. Our world will never be the same again. Do you feel that there are opportunities for educators and leaders in education, head teachers, principals like yourselves, to get together with your teaching teams and to say, right, I'm throwing down the gauntlet. We're not going to need that in the curriculum anymore. It's not going to work. This is what we're going to replace it with. Is Absolutely. that going to happen? Absolutely. I'll tell you a story, a metaphor of a bridge in the Honduras called Chotuleka. I don't know if you've heard of it, <laughs> but when this bridge was built, the, the area was inundated with floods and all kinds of disasters that would make this river swell. So the uh, people of the Honduras approached the Japanese to build a bridge which was so sturdy and so good that it would withstand all kinds of calamities. And the bridge was built, but then there came a big hurricane and typhoon which uh, broke all the bridges, swept away the roads leading to the bridge. It uh, really caused great devastation. After the, the hurricane, the bridge was still standing, but the river Chotuleka had changed its course. It now flowed alongside the bridge, showing us that sometimes we make these plans and this curriculum and we live by it, but actually the problem itself has changed. So the solutions must change now. That is a metaphor, that bridge which runs now parallel to that river is a bridge that goes nowhere because we were so consumed with our curriculum, with what we are going to teach. It was all set in stone. It was the best that we had made. It's the best that uh, the educators had made. But the problem changed. The river moved its course to flow alongside this bridge and the bridge served no purpose. So when we, we are so sworn to our ideas, our curriculum, and we are so rigid that we can't change and adapt to what is happening, that's very harmful. 
Therefore, what I would do is ask all head teachers, have a look at your curriculum. Some of the things are like the driver. They have changed their course and they're no longer valid. So we have to make space for what is relevant in our curriculum today. And for that, it requires all of us to be brave enough to take that risk and not cling on to that bridge that we have built and say, only if you cross this bridge, will you become successful because your bridge is going nowhere. Your bridge is going nowhere. Your river has changed its course. I wanted to ask you, Asha, when you've started the process now of rebuilding this curriculum, you, 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 you get the recovery in, you start putting in new programs, new content, where do you personally see the growth that is going to be coming in education? Where do you see these changes in the curriculum? Are they, I know what my thoughts are, I would like to know where you see it heading. What I fundamentally want to do is, uh, I always wanted climate literacy as part of our curriculum, but in terms of recovery, what I want to do is make children and people change their behaviors. Uh, in my attempt as the, the executive leader of climate change now for GEM schools, when I talk to head teachers, I find there's still a reluctance in some people to join us on the journey. There's no compulsion. I'm inviting them. And they say, no, there's no place, or we've already done it. It's already on our curriculum. But what they have in their curriculum is very, very superficial. I, having done your courses, know how much I learned through those case studies and the amount of material that was there about climate change myself and my teachers included, have a different knowledge of climate change now, having done the Educate Global courses. So what we wanted to do for our children is to first look at a sustainable diet, uh, because I think children are what they eat. And first, to get people to uh, do something, it has to be relevant to them. Now, it may not be about, so they want to become thinner, they want to become fitter, they want to become uh, you know, uh, more healthier, and that will get buy-in from the parents and the children because it's something that you're doing yourself. In doing that, we are also going to be weaving in the sustainability factor whereby if you make the right choices which are healthy for you, you're also going to be able to make right choices for your planet. And in doing that, we're going to make that connect. We're going to look at how a good nutrition and a good and healthy diet, exercise and sleep is going to make you not only healthier, but it's going to keep the planet greener and cleaner. We're going to do a research study on how this nutrition is going to affect students with special needs, because I am beginning to think that many of the children who have attention deficit, who have dyslexia, who are uh, you know, not concentrating, is all due to a combination of their diet, their sleep patterns, and their exercise. So I think this would become very relevant as we go. And at the same time, this is part of the green recovery curriculum I hope to put in place. Asha, how do you see the recovery curriculum starting to build those future world leaders? Do you think that there is a place in the recovery curriculum for programs and courses and blended learning and content to start the process of developing future leaders because they are in short supply? What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are that leaders have to think differently. And if you're giving them the opportunity, if you're giving your children and teachers the opportunity to think differently and to articulate those thoughts, you will begin to see leaders. People are not willing to examine my bridge, which I was talking about. They're still saying that is the only way to get your degree and then to become successful in life. Today, the pathways to children are manifold. And if you want leaders, if you want really, you have to speak your truth. You have to have courage. You have to 
take calculated risks. You have to be ready to explore the future of uncertainties. Those who have been successful during this pandemic were those who were adaptable, who were ready to change, who were realizing, yes, now we need something different and not trying to replicate a face-to-face -face classroom at home. Those who tried to do that were vastly unsuccessful. There were many things on the curriculum which we didn't teach because A, the resources at home were not sufficient, the environment at home was not suitable. So if I was trying to replicate my classroom, a face-to-face -face classroom at home, I would have made a disaster of it and parents would have been anxious. I would have been saying, print out this worksheet when there was no printer. So we used the resources at home. We tried to use what was around the child to educate the child. Because all of this, we haven't, we've lived through a pandemic at our age. I'm nearly 60 and I'm living through a pandemic. But there are my five-year-olds and four-year-olds who are actually wearing masks and seeing a different world. Now, they have learned and they are becoming leaders in their own right when they're given the opportunity to explore the impact of what is happening. And we must make sure that we give these platforms and we allow the curriculum to be flexible, to be relevant to what is happening around us. Those curricula which are not relevant, that are only conveying information, are not creating thinkers and leaders. They're just giving a body of information which already exists. And even that information is outdated. So if you want, if the way we can use the post pandemic or, or the life after this is settled is to embrace the new, the uncertain with courage to explore and say, yes, you will make mistakes, but we must go after those things for which we don't have answers, not try to take what we knew it and try to make stretch it into the life after this period. So you need brave people, you need courageous leaders, you need risk takers like Melanie to make that happen. I don't know so much about being a risk taker. I think uh, I'm pretty just, just, just off the wall crazy. Um, I wanted to ask you about testing. How, what, just a, just an, a, a sideball question here, curve, curveball question. How do you feel about the testing of children and to make sure to check are they have they got um, the virus and if they have they should go home and self isolate for a few days. Do you think that it is necessary for schools to become the testing agents the testing centers for the for the economy to start moving again. Do you think that teachers would be able to do this. I think it's a whole lot that we're asking from teachers in a school like mine with 5,000 plus children. If everyone were to opt to come back, we, it would be very difficult for the school to be engaged in the testing process. Uh, I think if a parent were, everyone is responsible for their safety. The school must provide a comfortable, safe environment. There should be the required measures for social distancing so that children are not uh, infected. At the same time, there's a responsibility with a parent to ensure that the child is healthy enough to return to school. It, it's a partnership, Melanie. I do not think uh, you can place the onus on any one side of, we, we are there to educate children and the parents want their children to learn in schools. So we have to hold hands and make sure that it's comfortable and right for the child. So the testing in terms of do you have it or you don't have it is necessary in as much as you don't want a sudden outbreak of several hundreds of children or teachers falling ill. But given the situation, we've left it in our school to parents to decide whether they would like to uh, come back to school and we are returning to school in a very staggered fashion. Asha, is there anything at all, if you had a magic bullet, if you had this, something that you could just wave this magic wand, what is the one thing that you would do for the world as a head teacher? 
as a head teacher, if I had a magic wand, I would focus on the process of learning rather than uh, evaluating children and giving them scores and worrying about their futures. Because if you are able to really make the learner connect, make their thinking visible and focus on the process, we will understand our children better. We'll understand their needs better. And every child and every family have their own aspirations. Who are we to define their curriculum? I would want the curriculum to be anything that the child wants to learn. Because only when you have a desire to learn will there be engagement in class. I might want, I might think Pythagoras theorem is very important to your learning, but the child might never ever use it in his life. So to my mind, if I had the freedom, I would say that while assessments are necessary to find out if this child is moving along the path, they're not the end. The idea that there is movement and that the child is allowed to explore this wonderful world of ours according to his or her likes is the ultimate way of learning. And that's what I would like to gift to every child. If you had your way to do that, to, to effectively just use assessments as baseline assessments to see are they achieving what they need to be achieving, um, and you wouldn't be doing all the tests and the SATs and all the other stuff like that, you would probably be bringing in a new order in the world, Asha, so I think you might be a bit dangerous. I don't think universities are going to like you in government. I don't think universities will exist as they are right now. They are also threatened in the way because this pandemic actually has uh, opened up a whole lot of things. The Pandora's box, as it were, questions are coming out about, is this what we need? Is, is this absolutely necessary? Because I know that I've never got a job because of my degrees. No one even asked them. They wanted to know my experience. They wanted to know what I would bring to the table. They wanted to know what values I had. They wanted to know whether I was ethical. They were not asking me in which college did you study and what uh, degree have you got? And even if they did ask, it was just a, you know, that must have been when I became a teacher for the first time. You know, you just want to know that you've got through because that is the requirement. But today what you want are critical thinkers, people who are able to take action. You look at what a Greta Thunberg is doing even out of school. You look at uh, young activists, you look at young people who have not yet completed their degrees. They're doing a whole lot more than we've ever done in our lives. They're impacting the world. and. Personally, that's what I would want for every one of us to do. Leave our impression on the world. Leave our impression as unique individuals who'll never walk this earth again. We have to be the best versions of ourselves. And that doesn't always come through uh, academic learning. I'm not trashing academic learning. It's necessary, but you should be given the freedom to choose what you want to learn. Just as on a TV channel, I will see what I like to, or I pick up a book that I wish to read. I might read a genre for six months and then shift to something different. I am in charge of my learning. And the more we allow children to learn and just be facilitators and ask them the big questions, I think we are setting the right direction. Because I think children are not what they were. They're not waiting to be crammed with knowledge. They know much, much more in their own right today. They're not the learners of yesterday. They're not like me who had to ask my teacher for everything. They already know or they know where to find the answers. So it, it's, it's a lot more. What we have to work as educators is create ethical beings whose values are in the right place by modeling and giving opportunities to our children to grow as good human beings and to use their capacities for the good of humanity. Absolutely. The, the talk that Professor Paula Garb gave as part of the virtual, um, the emotional recovery and the recovery curriculum virtual summit. Um, 
She has been working on uh, with us on the ver on the we call it the the um, I've lost my brain there. It's it's the Peaceful Planet Teacher Course. And we were talking about peace, incorporating peace and emotional literacy into the curriculum in a very big way. Because we know that without peace and justice, we cannot have sustainability. Absolutely. And you and I are all about sustainability and living and changing the way we are so that we have a planet that is habitable left for all of us, that is still going to be this beautiful place and even more so than it is now. Um, I, I personally feel that if we were teaching emotional literacy and peace within the curriculum, it will make a big, big difference. When I was a child, if I wanted to learn something, I'd have to go to the library get out the Encyclopedia Britannica. My father actually got us the Encyclopedia Britannica. And I'd only have a little piece that big on the item that I wanted to know. Now, if my daughter wants to learn anything, she goes on Wikipedia, Google, she asks how, she's in there, she's researching, she's going and finding research papers. I didn't have that at my fingertips. I didn't have that. And I think that that's why we need to be looking as with myself as an education specialist and a developer of content for schools and teachers, the new process of blended learning where we will have projects that are delivered or products delivered in school, but also delivered at home as well, online, anywhere. It doesn't have to be at home, it can be anywhere. And I think that the content that is in there has to be so unique so good because these children they know it all my daughter she did mini readers the other day um she was doing a project a science project um and i said to her well can you you know you want to learn it she was doing a, a mitigation of desertification and i said well there's a great story in there about roof gardens in egypt so she's gone and she's watched it and she's read through the teacher's lesson plan She's created a project and she said, this isn't really enough, you know? And I was like, what? And then I said, okay, well, you need to go and do the UN course on cities and climate change. She's a 12 year old. And if a 12 year old can do that sort of self-evaluation, work through the project, do the content at home in her own time, go and do that UN course, come away. And she said to me, do you know that I have a UN certificate and my teacher doesn't? How sad is that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the other project that she's been working on during lockdown is remember before when we were speaking, when we were in Dubai was how to get pupils to understand the media, how to be media savvy, how to have, we call it um, PR for your school. So we took a program called get media savvy and my 12 year old, daughter presented it as, as I would want to present it to children. And I left it at that. And she took everything she learned. She contacted the journalists. She got herself into the Guardian newspaper, Metro Money, BBC, and the Evening Standard. And only once did she ask the journalist to speak to me to get permission to give photos out. <laughs> And I just said, how did you do that? And she said, everything was there. You gave me the course. I learned the method. You showed me what to do. I followed it. I went and communicated. She said, it's the communication skills. She said, you've got to sort that course out because my communication skills, I need to know how to phone somebody and what to say and not go, yeah, okay. Um, she said, mom, you know, you've always taught me to say, good afternoon, Hannah Jane speaking. She said, that really helped. <laughs> so that, that to me is interesting because they have it all, but they want more. They don't just want the standard, that old textbook stuff, like the Encyclopedia Britannica and all the other stuff that we've seen out there online. That doesn't serve them. <laughs> yes. They, they want more. No, I just... 
It is we who have defined their boundaries. We decide what they must learn in every grade level. We set a cap on what they can learn. And we tell them, no, you learn more about it the next year. But these children are not going to wait till next year. They're not even going to wait till the next moment. If they want to learn and they have the means to learning that, they're learning by themselves. So we have to reinvent ourselves as teachers because our roles as we knew it is not going to be the same anymore. I think it's very exciting. I think that we've been through um, a traumatic, traumatic experience. Um, we, we took our elderly grandmother, uh, who's 80 years old, out of the um, elderly home. She lives with us and she's transformed our lives. We've learned more from this octogenarian about life and the past and the future than we could ever have learned from any Google any TV program. Uh, my mother was obsessed with the daily death count. And then we got rehomed hens and now she's obsessed with the daily egg count. <laughs> and we can learn from experiences. We need to start tapping into humanity, into that collective brain that is out there. We are losing so much by not integrating and asking humans. We go online, we think everything is online. We need to start asking our peers and our parents and our grandparents and our great grandparents and our aunties and our uncles. And I, there are, you know, we had a lunch the other day. I met two girls, oh, I've got to teach you about this. You've got to see this, Asher. Your kids will be doing this. These two young girls, 11 and 12, they entered a handwriting competition called 500 Words and they didn't win. So they said, oh, you know what, doesn't matter. And they wrote their own books and published their own books. And they said, who's the winner now? I was like, yeah, okay, cool. And we were sitting around the table and the mother was sharing us their grandfather's chili oil. And I said, well, is your granddad still with you? She said, no, he, he used to travel all, he, all over the world to all the families. And every family member has their own favorite recipe, but they use his chili oil because that was his gift. He used to bring this oil. And I said, but have you got a, where are these recipes? And she said, I don't know. I said, well, can you make a book? Can I have these recipes? Because I was, there was the side dish. Ah, oh, it was mind blowing. And I said, no, I've got to have this recipe. We need everybody's recipe. Yes. We need to start tapping in to these recipes, these family recipes, these family ideas, the learning from generations. And this that's is what you're doing, Melanie, in bringing together so many people to speak of their experiences. You're creating the recipes. You're putting it out there for the world to take. And that's wonderful because that's what Educate Global has been doing. And that has been your mission right from the start to give. And God loves a cheerful giver. And you've been giving and giving of yourself until I don't know uh, if there's anything left to give. Because every time I see everything coming together, you have contributed much more than I have seen people do in a lifetime in these last few years that I've known you. That's very kind of you, Asha. I just think, you know, you've, you've, you've got to give to get. You, you, you have to give. I, I sometimes I wonder, I, you know, I have, I have some teachers sending me really nasty messages. They go, why is this not available anymore? And then I say, but it's changed. That was April last year. You're phoning me in August the next year. It doesn't exist anymore. We evolve. We move. We, we have to be nimble. We can't. You know, the old bureaucracies where they create an old course in 2016 and they think that that's still, no, we move, you know, we've got to be nimble. So I'm really looking forward with you as the, what is you, you are now the executive director of climate change for all of the Germans group globally. Yes. yes. And you are going to be ensuring that every single gem school 
gets an Educate Global Award, at the least the Bronze Award. Yes, that's, that's the Good. intent, Melanie. Good. But like I was sharing with you, I don't compel people. They must, you know, when there is a champion in the school, like Vijaya is a champion in her school. She's really invested and you can see the difference in her interest levels. Uh, and if the leaders and the, teach, the principals don't support the champions of sustainability, they can't get things off the ground because much as they wish to do it, they do not have the authority to implement it in their schools. The most valuable lesson for me was failing. My idea was I honestly believed that we only needed one climate change teacher in every school. And you taught me that I was wrong because you, you showed me that it has to come from the top of that pyramid. It has to be the head teacher, the principal. You have to nominate your sustainability and climate change lead. They have to nominate their five support team members. And that's the start of your process. Having that first leadership team. And then when they go up to silver, having one for early years, one for key stage one, one for key stage two. That is how you integrate your levels and your layers throughout your curriculum. Because they have to know that that leader says so. That leader believes in it. The leader wants it to be so. It is going to be so. Yes. And if that doesn't happen, I had lots of phone calls from teachers um, saying, I'm so passionate about this. I've done the course, but my head teacher doesn't support me. Yes. And I was, I was like an agony aunt on the phone, you know, providing all this emotional support. And that was when I said, no, 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 no. We, if a school, if the head teacher isn't behind this at all, please, please don't, don't, you know, we are not here. We did not, now this is a horrible thing to say, and I'm probably going to be destroyed on Twitter for it. But we, on, we did not create this for, for badge or certificate collectors. We created this for, for teams to deliver tangible change within education, within their education system that they are in. Because we find that when that happens, when we have a school that does that, like yours, they don't just teach the children, they teach the entire community, everything. So and I was sharing with you, uh, I've, I've twinned with a school in Gold Coast in Queensland, Australia, and they have a, a large number of schools all the way on Gold Coast. And my first uh, uh, intention is to share our story of climate change and climate literacy. So they asked me, what are the three things that uh, you know your school's good at? And uh, so I have listed climate literacy. I said, I'm very passionate and I want to share that. I would like to see you. So as soon as we get on board, I'm going to ask them to look at Educate Global. So St. Hilda's is the school which is twinning with us. And uh, I have, I'm in touch with the person who's in charge of the whole group of schools on Gold Coast. And once I get St. Hilda's on board, I will then ask them to be the agents of change uh, in Queensland. That's fantastic, that's fantastic. I think that with leaders that know their way around the system, we need to nurture the future head teachers, the future principals coming through. And if we are going to deliver the most powerful recovery curriculum on the planet, we have to work together. We cannot scattergun. We have to have a long-term strategy. We have to all work together, plan, plan, have a, have a minimum of a 10-year plan together and say, this is where we're going. This is how we're going to transform the education system from the inside out, from the bottom to the top. It's not a top-down change. It's a bottom-up change. Bottom-up, middle out and the top have no choice but to join us i've That's always it. said that always thank you so so much asha you're, you're and I welcome it was such a pleasure to see you after so many months i can't i want to come back i want yes, to come you back. must I, I was all set for october 2020 and expo and we were talking to the program director and it was so unfortunate, but anyway, it's been postponed. It is there next year. In the meanwhile, we have to get several other things underway. It gives us another year to 
put in place really solid evidences that you know place us where we ought to be so it's actually given us another year's time i think to build yes, our i definitely found that the covid-19 the lockdown i've been i found that i could i could stop because educate global was just so intense with so many schools coming at me that i had this this window of opportunity to start going okay what do they need what are the needs they need content they need teacher training support a lot of teachers were coming back saying okay well we've done these courses how do we now teach climate change so we have to create that inset training and and then coming up with a peaceful planet teacher course uh, with nasa we go we're working on the conflict resolution teacher training mega and it just it just gave me time because i needed to do many readers build wild planet explorers juniors wild planet build get media savvy kids i had some time to get everything together uh and and do do the crazy stuff and start trialing it so that as of september when the schools start coming in to recover uh hammersworth and fulham borough council we're going to have all of their schools are going to do the bronze and the silver award but they are the ones that have kindly you know they've they've given me permission to give this emotional recovery training for teachers it's so good i just said to them do you know this can't just stay in 49 schools this has to go to every school in the world not everybody has a child psychologist and an education psychologist and a team in place to build training like this schools don't have this they're just trying to tread water just to keep their communities going Yeah. So they I was so I mean when Jan Pana Al said uh, so that's where we go and it's going to be so cool and I want to be looking at everything else we're doing in the near future and we're going to be seeing you again soon Asha. Yes it. I was looking at all my photos of us on the sand dunes. <laughs> I was looking yesterday I was like oh, really oh, lovely. I want to go back. Uh, sure. I should, share them. I, sh I should share all the photographs in a document yes. here underneath this video yes. of 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 the trip to Dubai and I will share the virtual summit of the Guardian visual feature about what we did. Yes. And what happened next. Absolutely. This is what happened next. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much Yo. Asha. I can't wait if there's any documents that you want to include any PDFs please let me know and we will attach it below this talk any yeah. recommended reading give me a recommended reading list with hyperlinks we'll shove it in below this and and if any teacher wants to get in touch with Asha or ask us any questions please contact us at support at educateglobal.org so it's support okay. s u p p o r t at educate, educate global. global so it's e d u c c a t e global.org from me melanie howard from the amazing asha alexander over there at kindergarten starters in dubai we'll be sure to seeing you all on the other side bye bye then